Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. If you're paying attention, you know that you only make money when you work. It might be great money, but it's dependent on you. The information on this podcast will help you solve that. We interview experts and provide analysis into financial freedom through commercial real estate. Why? To help physicians like you thrive. Let's dive in. Welcome to Search and Syndicate. This is your host, Dr. Michael McManus, and we are back here for the second half of our conversation with Zach Alms. Uh, Zach is the founder of 507 Capital with over 13 years of real estate experience and over $15 million of assets under management. In the first half of our discussion, we, we uh, talked about Zach's entry in, into real estate. And like a lot of people kind of came through the uh, multifamily space, but due to frustrations with tenants, was looking for a different way to go and now focuses on retail strip centers. Uh, Zach, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. All right. So when we finished up the first half of this conversation, we're talking about that um, you like retail strip centers that are mostly stabilized and, and maybe have just a little bit of lease out left. Um, so how does that work out? I guess, you know, and looking a lot, we talk a lot about value add and, you know, so if you're buying a strip center with that's half empty, that you can make a lot more money because you can, you can increase the value by, by renting out the rest of that, but there's mm -hmm. more risk to it too. Um, so tell me a little bit more about your philosophy and, and why you choose the the mostly rented, mostly stabilized properties over ones that have a bigger value add component to it? So yeah, there's a it's a good question. There's a there's a fine line between going for like a a, a large value add where you're filling a you know 100% vacancy. You, you know there's that's a high risk um, investment, and then there's the you know buying a a property that's let's say 75% occupied and the upside is filling 25% um, with a new tenant. But the but your downside is pretty well protected because you have, you know, those tenants, 75% of the building is occupied with um, long-term tenants paying, paying rent. And so you're, you know, it's a really very more risk adverse where, um, you know, you can, you can do a speculative investment you know, let's say fill in a vacant building or doing development or, you know, lots of things like that. But you just got to weigh your risk versus reward. Um, and so I, I like the, you know, a little bit of both, mostly stabilized, but a little bit of value add. Um, it, yeah, creates a better investment, I think. So we're now in a space where a lot of investors have become uh, a little more risk averse. Uh, as you know, after the got a little skittish with changes in interest rate environment and with things were really hot in the multifamily space, the, the apartment building syndication was, was crazy, you know, a few years ago and then interest rates changed and some investors got capital calls or aren't getting their, you know, their, their payments because with different interest rates, things aren't working out for them as well. Um, so the way you've been doing it, have you had any of those experiences in the retail space where things changed and, and it was it was tougher making your game plan play out? No, I can't say I have because everything that I buy or I'm acquiring, we we make sure that it works day one. Like it's cash flowing with you know long term leases in place. It's you know cash flowing. Let's just say it hits our prep um, from day one. And so, you know, also because we have these these long term tenants in place and, you know, um, larger tenants that, you know, nationally recognized brands. They're not going anywhere that once they're in a location, they're pretty sticky. And so you're you know, it's it's pretty safe. And so, no, we haven't really had any um, big hiccups, um, you know, when we have to refinance some of the deals we did a couple of years ago, we'll still be in a, a fine position because we acquired them at the, you know, at a good basis, a good price. So yeah, no, um, I like the market we're in right now because it creates, you know, it creates a lot of fear and there's not a lot of people doing deals, I think. And so um, if I can make deals work now, 
they're going to be even better in two years. So would you say that your your approach is a little more risk averse? That that you don't you're not, you know, people talk about commercial real estate, and I think especially when they they've seen an empty strip mall at some point in time, and they're like, oh, that's that's why they're scared of it. Um, but if done right, it's a real risk averse approach to to investing. For sure, and not only you know, yeah, you you know, seeing an empty strip mall. I'd be surprised to see an empty strip mall these days because retail real estate right now is at its lowest vacancy rate ever. So, I mean, unless it's very, you know, unless it's a really bad location, it's not going to be a vacant strip mall. And so, um, re- yeah, retail, not only is retail having its day right now, you know, lowest vacancy rates on record, but also with these leases that we have, they're triple net leases. So that means we're, we're getting um, property taxes, property insurance, and common area maintenance expenses. Um, pay back by the tenants for their pro rata share of the building. So that also creates a very predictable, not only risk adverse, but predictable income because we know almost exactly what we'll be getting in rent. You know, we we do know what we're getting, getting in rent. And then we know that our all our operating costs are covered. So it's a very predictable investment as well. So that difference is an example of the other side of that. So on the backside of COVID, um, I had a property, uh, a residential property, a fourplex, that the city, you know, all their expenses went up post COVID because everybody was getting paid more and everything was. So property taxes went up like they reassessed everything in town and property taxes went up like 20%. Mm-hmm. And then the snowplow guy, all his expenses were higher. So that expense went up 20%. And the electrical company race rates, 10 percent and it went from being a nice cash flowing property to not making money anymore because basically all the expenses went up 20 percent between taxes utilities maintenance pretty much everything now right when i was you know about to get scared out of my pants that uh because vacancies were low in this town we were able to raise rents with that. Now, you know, now you got tenants screaming and everybody claims, you know, the landlords are 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 cheating everybody, but they what they don't realize is sometimes the landlords are sweating it more than they are. But so the difference now, if you're doing retail, is when that tax bill comes in and it went up or utilities went up, that's all just goes straight to the tenant. And so it yeah. doesn't really affect you much at all. Yeah, the only effect it would have is if you ha- don't have a triple net lease or if you have vacancy in the building. You know, let's say you have 20% vacancy in the building, well that you're going to, you know, you're going to be able to have you have to cover those costs, 20% of the pro rata share. But yeah, for the most part it's, if it's a 100% occupied building, those costs, you know, 100% go off to the pass through to the tenant. So for for your investors, they even with those changes, they didn't really see any change in their position. No. Nope. So have you ever nope. had to do a capital call or or drop your pref? <laughs> no, I've not done. I I'll admit I knew the answer to that question because uh, <laughs> I I heard it asked you at at the at the best ever conference. So it's a yeah. it's a good question to answer. Um, so let's, let's dive into a little bit more about what you're doing at 507 Capital right now. Cause I know you've, you've got a new fund and, uh, you're looking at, at kind of, you have a plan for the next few years. So tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So yeah, we're, we're right now we're raising for a $10 million fund. We're acquiring somewhere between four and eight strip malls within this fund that are mostly stabilized with some value add as well. Let's just say 100% stabilized deals and then a couple better value add deals. The, uh, you know, the mentality is that we can make deals work right now, especially with these stabilized deals. They will be, um, you know, they'll be when, if and when interest rates go down, these, the the cap rates will also go down with these um, investments. And so we can offload them in three, five, seven, 10 years for uh, a substantial. Um, profit and everybody wins. 
So right now, what are the the things you're finding difficult to get deals done right now? What's the hardest part about it? There's a lot of difficult um, finding, you know, finding anything that the sellers you know, or owners even want to sell, like the finding, um, finding something that's at a reasonable price because, you know, owners are still, or sellers still are kind of holding on to prices they kind of had two years ago or three years ago. So finding something where people are willing to sell at today's market and then also getting the correct financing terms where it, it cash flows. Like I said, I wanted all I want all of our um, investments or purchases in and in within this fund to be able to hit our prep. Right? We have a six percent prep. So, you know, any of you get a good spread between the cap rate that we're buying at and the interest rate that we're getting. So there's a lot of difficult and moving pieces to all of it, but um, we're finding deals. We have three under contract right now and uh, hopefully have a few more coming soon. So you guys are, are focused in the Midwest. What uh, What is it about the Midwest right now that makes it a great place to be buying retail properties? The Midwest is kind of um, a steady Yeti. You know, it, it's, it's, it's very consistent. It's, you can get normally get better cash flow on from your investment day one being buying in the Midwest. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Minnesota. So I'm familiar with the Midwest. Um, but I think the, you know, the other part of flip side of buying in the Midwest is we also buy in secondary and tertiary markets, which is a lot of the markets that don't that aren't focused on the larger funds and so we're kind of getting we can find those better deals even if it's a you know a starbucks anchored strip center or a aspen dental or a jimmy john's or Cadoba. we can get these really nice class a buildings in these markets that aren't looked at as often um and so we're you know we can they can be cash flowing pretty well from day one and yeah, the Midwest, um, to answer your question, I just, I love the Midwest. I'm from the Midwest. It's not, it hasn't, it doesn't fluctuate as much as other markets, you know, so the Southeast or the Sun Belt or, um, so we're just, yeah, very consistent. So again, where you talked about your, your whole philosophy is pretty conservative. You're buying properties that have to cash flow from day one. So not a lot of speculation there right. in a market that, doesn't tend to fluctuate a lot. I mean, I think the the last big fluctuation in the Midwest was when the, the automakers all had their trouble back in the 70s. Yeah. So <laughs> so since then, and maybe we're on the backside of it now, it seems like a lot of the interest in bringing industry, reshoring industry is kind of, kind of focused in the Midwest, that there's there's a lot going on with, with new jobs coming there now on and these are investments, you know, when somebody builds a factory, uh, they don't plan on, you know, that's, that's some long-term capital planning. <laughs> yeah. A, yeah. It's a, a 20 to 50 year investment. Right. Um, uh, so the, what, what places in the Midwest are you, are you liking right now? Are there certain states or areas you like better, or is it really just the, the deal and where you're finding where somebody's willing to sell? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, there's, I I like the sec, like I said, the secondary and the tertiary markets. So, you know, let's. I'm in Minnesota, so I'm not really buying in the Twin Cities, Metro, Minneapolis, St. Paul. I'm not really buying in, you know, the big markets like Chicago, um, or just the really big markets. But what we like about so we're focusing on, you know secondary tertiary markets that have good upward growth, they have good demographics, you know, population growth, they have good um, traffic drivers to the, the city, let's say a, a university or a really good um, employer that's not going anywhere anytime soon. So there, they, you know, there has, and then it, we also have to find the deals within those markets. Um, we're not really focusing on only small, you know, only, let's just say, only one city. We're looking at everything and then we have to we have to uh you know do our due diligence and research the market and get out there and learn as much as we can are there any markets that you in the midwest that you don't like right now that uh 
seem like they're maybe going in the wrong direction? Any market that has negative population growth where, or, you know, population exodus, we're not really looking at. So there's, there's definitely markets in the Midwest that are, you know, trending that way. Um, but yeah, we're looking at everything else. Okay. Are there, are there any areas that you see more growth right now in the Midwest than others that seem like they're kind of the booming market or do you find little micro, you know, I guess that's the thing you can, you can have one town that's doing great in the middle of a state that overall you're not going to hear about in in the national papers. Yeah, that's kind of the way it is. We, you know, there's, there can be, uh, I'm from Mankato, Minnesota. It's kind of a, it's booming right now. Rochester, Minnesota is also really close by. Those are some really booming markets, um, but they're smaller. They're, they're kind of under the radar. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking at markets like that where there there's really good population growth there's job growth but um you know there's sometimes it's you know i can't focus on 100 cities like that i have to wait till the deal comes up as well so okay are who are you finding are the most motivated sellers right now is there any or is it just a random who's out there I don't have a good answer for that. The, you know, a motivated seller could it be anyway, anyone from just trying to upgrade to the next, you know, do a 1031 exchange into a, a larger, better deal. It could be somebody that has debt terms come and due in the next year and they just don't want to have to deal with it. That's probably, that's probably the biggest motivator for sellers right now is that they might have debt come and due within the next year or so. And instead of, let's say injecting capital into it or not cash flowing as well as they used to, they might just sell now. Okay. You know, I keep hearing and reading things where they talk about this generational transfer of wealth and that, you know, the the majority of assets in the country now are owned by baby boomers. And as they're aging, that these things are going to be sold. And in my, my experience, I haven't found a bunch of them jumping up and down to sell and actually found few that they've they've owned these buildings for a long time and they kind of want to be they kind of want to sell but they can't quite pull the trigger and i guess if you've owned something for 30 years it's hard to let go of it but uh are are you seeing that same thing are you seeing any of this generational transition or the kind of the same like not quite ready i'm seeing the same thing you are where you know yes I, I think that there's a lot of properties owned by that, you know, the baby boomers, but they've owned these properties for so long that they're pretty knowledgeable in what their property might be worth um, or what they think they can get. So, and they're, they're under no timeline to sell, you know, because other than maybe like being really old, but well, that wouldn't be a baby boomer. So they, you know, I, yeah, they're, they're not really selling unless they have to because they probably don't have much debt on these properties. And so, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, we looked at one, the guy, I guess he would have been older than a baby boomer because I think he was in his 80s. Um, and I know we looked at some of the deals to get the same deals at one point, but there was one that the guy wanted to sell and he kept saying, oh, I want to sell this because I know the kids are going to fight. And and he dinked around. I, the first time I heard about the deal was a couple of years ago. And uh, it never really got to where he could even price it and then unfortunately he passed which was the reason he was talking about selling it and then on the backside, what happened was exactly what what he was talking about is then all the kids were fighting over it that one wanted to sell it today one wanted to keep it one just wanted to piss the rest of them off and, <laughs> and we put in an offer on it and like Day one, it looked like they were going to sign it, and yeah. then it never got done. But it, it just it just fizzled out. So it was one of those. Uh, I thought, oh, here's this demographic shift. We finally found it. We're we're going to capitalize on it, and it just went nowhere. It was just a lot of talk. It went on really for on and off for a very long time until I finally was just like, all right, well, if you guys really want to sell, you got an offer. So yeah. give me a call. Those can those can sometimes be the best investments though too when there's you know a bunch of siblings fighting over it and you know maybe the attorney gigs evolves and just says sell it you know they don't they 
I've I've bought a couple properties from states or from um you know something like that and they've they've turned out to be pretty good deals. If you can if you can get the price where everybody agrees, I guess. Is there anything uh anything special that uh you know to help have you ever got involved with helping them sort out the family thing or just been there when they no. decided to sell? No, thank you. No, I have not done that. <laughs> Don't to be the family counselor. <laughs> I always love those stories where somebody comes in and solves the bigger problems, you know, that people are fighting and they clean the whole thing up and then get the deal out of the whole thing. So mm -hmm. anyway, all right. Well, Zach, before we wrap up here, any, any last thoughts on, on where we are today in commercial real estate and especially in retail um, that you think make a compelling argument that most people out there aren't hearing that argument from most of the sources they hear. I just say that, you know, today in today's market, you can you can buy or invest in a retail asset, retail strip centers. I think it'd be a good investment because, you know, retail real estate right now is is doing really well. The, you know, the the neighborhood strip centers, the, the where you go for your your nails, your hair, your coffee, those aren't going anywhere anytime soon and they're just solid investments. And yeah, that's all I got to say. All right. If somebody wanted to get a hold of you and learn more, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Probably the best way would be to go to my website. It's 507capitalgroup.com. Or you can check me out on LinkedIn. Uh, Zach Alms on LinkedIn. All right, Zach, thank you so much for being here today. I think it's been a great conversation for people who, you know, there's just not a lot we get to hear about retail. Um, for everybody listening, thanks for being here today. If you have any questions, would like to know more, please reach out to Zach. Uh, you can reach out to myself through uh, surgeonsyndicate.com website, and we can get you in touch with Zach too if you're having any trouble. Um, so thank you for being here and join us next time on Surgeon Syndicate. This has been an episode of Surgeon Syndicate. If you got value from this episode, you know other surgeons are hungry to become job optional, and you can help them by sharing this content today. Schedule a call and we can make a plan. Looking forward to having you with me on the next episode.